Thank you so much for being here. Welcome as we uh, enter into a new series uh, together today called Kings and Kingdoms. Uh, the Bible uh, tells us incredible things happen when we decide to put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Too many to enumerate here in this moment, uh, but one of them that is, uh, that is important as we head into this series is that we understand is that there is a change of citizenship. There is a movement from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light that we, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we become citizens of heaven. And our role changes from being a citizen of earth to now being an ambassador to earth as a citizen of heaven. And so uh, there is there there's this big kingdom that Jesus talked about, and it's the it's the kingdom of God. And then on earth, we see there are all kinds of little kingdoms, uh, little kings, little kingdoms. And as a big kingdom member now, as a follower of Jesus, I now uh, have to live as a a within all these little kingdoms and underneath these little kings, but as a representative or an ambassador from the big kingdom, capital K kingdom. And this, uh, uh, as you can imagine, as you've experienced, produces an incredible amount of tension because the big kingdom and all the little kingdoms and all the little kings are nothing like the big kingdom and the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So how is it, and this is what we're going to be doing over the next four weeks, we're going to be asking this question, how is it that a big kingdom member functions and functions well uh, among and in and under little kings and little kingdoms, always keeping in mind the kingdom that they actually belong to and that they're on mission uh, amongst all the little kings and the little kingdoms. And today, our conversation revolves around the idea of staying true, staying faithful. Um, a few years ago, uh, 2016, uh, there was an event that took place that uh, just warmed my heart. Uh, we watched and I watched and paced and panicked and turned the TV off and turned it on and off and on again as my beloved Chicago Cubs uh, were in the seventh game of the World Series in this incredible uh, turn of events as they were down in this series three games to one and they came back and won three in a row to be the World Series champions after countless years and decades of futility. And I remember as a kid, uh, I, would, I would watch those Cubs games all summer long, just love cheering for the Cubbies. And, and boy, it's hard to be a Cubs fan because our favorite thing is, you know, to say, and everybody does, right? Wait till next year. And well, this year came and it was a lot odd season, absolutely, and the Cubbies came storming out of the gate, and they were doing so good, and then kind of, you know, plateaued and just kind of stayed there, made it into the playoffs, in which time they were summarily swept right out, season's over. Well, well, there's always next year, and next year, I'll watch and I'll cheer, and I'll celebrate, and I'll probably end up saying, well, there's always next year, but gonna stay true, gonna stay faithful uh, in, in the middle of it all. And that idea, that is, is so important to us, isn't it? To, for, for someone, for us and others, 
to us and towards us to remain faithful, to stay true, to be a person, hey, if it's uh, top of the world, if it's, you know, a deep, dark valley, uh, we know that there are those who are going to be true to us and there are those we are going to be true to, true to our commitments, true to our loyalties, true uh, to the investments. And, and this picture of being true is a very strong component of what that means to be a big kingdom member living uh, in little kingdoms under little kings is that even in the midst of that reality we understand our primary loyalty now is to the big kingdom not these little kingdoms uh, they come and go come and go. The big kingdom is eternal. And so to help us um, walk through this reality of being a big kingdom member in a little kingdom world, we're going to be following uh, the story, a little bit of the story anyway. Of, of some guys, uh, one named Daniel, one uh, named Mishael, Azariah, and uh, gee, there's, there's a fourth one there, and I'm trying to remember their uh, Hananiah. They're, those are their Jewish names. We may know them better as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were their Babylonian names. Well, these four guys were clearly big kingdom guys, and yet they were living in a little kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom, under a little king named Nebuchadnezzar. And so they had this reality going on, just like you and I do, of being big kingdom members in a little kingdom world. And even in their own country, which they had been, uh, they'd been run out of, the Babylonians conquered and dragged them all. And so they're basically put into a position of slavery at this point. Uh, and, and even before that, when they were in their own country, they still lived under a little king and a little kingdom. Uh, it, it always keep in mind that the big kingdom and the big king is God's kingdom and God himself. And they were uh, and they are a wonderful illustration to us of how it is one lives a big kingdom life in a little kingdom world. And uh, we're going to begin thinking about this idea of staying true, staying faithful. And so we're going to be in chapter one of Daniel and get your Bibles turned out to there. Daniel chapter one, verses eight through 21. And I'll read this. Uh, follow along, please. And uh, we'll make a few observations uh, about staying true. Uh, Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat these unacceptable foods. Now, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded, I am afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths your age, I am afraid the king will have me beheaded. And Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and waters, Daniel said. And at the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel a special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. When the training period ordered by the king was completed, the chief of staff brought all the young men to King Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and no one impressed him as much as Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. Whenever the king consulted them in any matter requiring wisdom, balance, judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of King Cyrus. 
So here it all begins. Four young men ripped out of their country, a lot of family killed, left and separated. And there they are uh, within this training program, indoctrination, basically, of the Babylonians to become of service to Nebuchadnezzar's little K kingdom, the little king. And so here they are in this place. And what happens? Well, immediately they are confronted with this reality of a little K kingdom. And that is the little K kingdom does not share the convictions and the belief and the faith of the, those who are part of the big K kingdom. And, and they are given food, meat, uh, specifically sacrificed to idols and, and wine used in idol worship, these types of things. And this is in direct conflict with the word of God. And so Daniel and, and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah are put in a place place attention. What do I do? There's big kingdom. There's little kingdom. Here we go right out of the gate. Boom. There's tension. How do I handle this reality? How do I stay true in the midst of this? So what do we see happening? Daniel made a decision. Uh, he determined in his heart not to defile himself. He determined, and this is a very strong word. Uh, this was a, a decision of the will, of the heart, of the mind, that I am not going to live and accept this reality of, of doing life in contradiction to the word of God. He determined that was a decision. And here we see something very important about a big kingdom life. It doesn't just happen to say, hey, I, I believe in Jesus. I'm a part of I'm a citizen of heaven now. Uh, great. And, you know, here we go. I'm just going to do life and I'll just automatically uh, be living consistently with with all the truth uh, and, and commands of the big kingdom. No, no, there's a decision. Jesus said, if you wish to be my disciples, you got to deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. There is a determination of the will to daily surrender to the authority and the leading of the Holy Spirit into the footsteps of Jesus. There is a determination that needs to take place, a decision that says, this is what I am going to do. And so we need to take an inventory of our life. Am I, am I, am I claiming to be a Jesus follower? And if so, have I determined in my heart every single day to be attentive to the word of God that I live in obedience to it? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah did it even down to something we may see, think is kind of minute is, well, the food on the table for them. No. Nope. It was a big deal because it was in violation of the big kingdom. And they're members of that kingdom. They're not members of this little kingdom, Babylon, and, and this little king, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 9, verse 17, we see something else very significant. Uh, God gave, God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. So here we see divine intervention. Uh, in verse 17, we see a couple of more examples of this. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. So God gave these four uh, uh, an ability uh, uh, of mind to understand, to learn, uh, to to uh, be wise in the applications of things that are true and right and good. Uh, then we see also in verse 17 that God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. Now, these, these were gifts from God. Uh, and Daniel and the other three stewarded very well the gifts that God had given them. They stewarded these gifts. They took care of these gifts. They used these gifts to what end? The purposes of the big kingdom, not the little kingdom. 
It, and if serving, uh, uh, helping the little kingdom and helping the little king, as they did numerous times, uh, would forward the bigger agenda of the big kingdom and the big king, that's what they would do. And so here they are in this place using those gifts that God gave them. Because you see, a big kingdom life requires big kingdom resources. So this reality that we find ourselves in as a Jesus follower, if I'm going to live the life of Jesus, if I'm going to obey the word of God, if I'm going to be a person who makes a difference in this world and the lives of other people, if I am going to faithfully do those good works that God prepared ahead of time for me to do, big resources are needed. Kingdom resources are needed, capital K. It is the Holy Spirit who gives us both the desire and the power to do that which pleases God. And so we understand, apart from Jesus, he told us this in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. But Paul would say, uh, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So there's this understanding that anything that is going to be defined as good will have to be the outworking of the power of God within us. It cannot, it will not ever come from our own efforts or our own flesh. It's because you see, a big kingdom life requires a big kingdom resources and God has given those to us. Are you using yours? All those things that God has given you, all that he's entrusted to you, relationships, experiences, uh, the, uh, uh, the wisdom, the, the, the knowledge of the word, uh, his love. Are you engaging all of those things for the capital K kingdom, the big kingdom? Here we're being challenged by their example to steward well through submission and surrender the big kingdom resources that God has given us. Story continues, verse 10 through 13. Very interesting as we see it unfold. Um, the, the chief of staff over all of this uh, indoctrination program, uh, God gave gave uh, uh, him a heart for Daniel. Now, um, he, he was responsible for them with his life. He drops the ball. He's a dead man. And so he tells Daniel, man, I'm not changing the food. The king himself said, you got to eat this. Sorry. I like you. Love you even, but it ain't happening. Well, apparently there were authorities underneath the chief of staff designated. And there was one, an attendant, who had been assigned to these four guys. And so David, remember, he determined, he had made a decision. He was committed to the reality of not defiling himself. So what did he do? He went to the next person who could, who could help him in this situation. And he said to him, hey, um, I tell you what, let's, let's do a little test. Let's do a little test. Ten days, give us nothing but vegetables and water. And, and in that word vegetables, as commentators were pointing out, that that would include grains and breads and these kinds of things, as well as vegetables and water to drink. And uh, th these were all things that had not been a part of idol worship. And so they were okay for, for, for Daniel and his friends to eat. And he said, just test us with that. Look at us after 10 days and see what that looks like compared to everybody else. And, and then make your decision whether or not you would continue to do that. So Daniel proposed a test. He proposed a test. And isn't it wonderful that his test did not ask this attendant to become uh, a, a martyr for his personal convictions. So in this test that Daniel presented was protection provided for the attendant. Hey, after 10 days, either way, it's not going to be this big dramatic thing and you'll be okay. You won't be in, in trouble. Um, and, but look at us, see if there's any difference at all. And he found that, yeah, there was a big difference. Daniel and his friends look stronger and healthier and better than all the others. 
Wow. And so he continued. After that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. And this is so important that we catch a lot of things coming from that. Um, a big kingdom life puts, uh, uh, puts one's faith into action. It's one, say, one thing to say, I believe, and it's another thing to say, hey, I believe to the point of trust. And trust means I am going to, to move and going to act according to that which I believe. If I believe what God says, then there will be behaviors that flow out of that, that the little kingdoms and the little kingdoms kings are going to tell us are so foolish. Why would you do that? That doesn't make any sense because it's, it's a big kingdom reality and little kings and little kingdoms, they don't understand that. And so it is the responsibility of those living a big kingdom life to put their faith into action. And then we see that these men, these young men, once they were brought before Nebuchadnezzar, were shown to be head and shoulders above everybody else. Certain God's hand was upon them. They were blessed. And they were in a place now of influence, leadership, and example for the big kingdom in the middle while they lived in a little kingdom under a little king. Isn't that fascinating? God is going to position you and I this way, too. We live under little kings and little kingdoms. People all over the world do. And the question is, in the midst of that, are we going to live a big kingdom life or not? These, these men, they determined to do so. They stewarded the resources well that God had given them. They were willing to put their faith into action because that's what somebody living a big kingdom life does. See, a big kingdom life may be lived in Babylon, but it is not of Babylon. And Paul would echo that idea in the New Testament. We are to live in this world, but we are not of this world. This isn't our home. We're strangers here. We're passing through. We're here as ambassadors. Our citizenship is in heaven, and our lives ought to reflect it. And a big kingdom life is the best life. It's the best life. It's the life we were created to live. The big kingdom life is one lived in fellowship with our creator, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, the capital K king. And that is, we were, we were created for that fellowship with him, that relationship with him. And as we enter into a big kingdom life, fundamentally at its core is a relationship with God, a relationship where he takes the first step, he loves first, and it's filled with grace, it's filled with mercy, and there is peace, there is forgiveness, Forgiveness as we submit ourselves to him through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow, a big kingdom life is the best life. So in response, there are some things that really just roll out, including the ones we've already mentioned. Matthew 6, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. You got it the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. The priority is the big kingdom. Seek that first. So how does that look in your world? What does that mean to seek first the kingdom of God? Great question. And I want to encourage you to, to see this word as a springboard into pursuit of that with God in your relationship with him. Another point of action here. Um, it, it's time for us to really have a little self-introspection to really ask ourselves, are, are there some little kingdom thoughts that have deep roots in our minds? Do we have little kingdom thinking that is tearing us up on the inside? Are there things in this old world uh, that, we've, that we have uh, 
gravitated to, we've grabbed a hold of, and, and we, we're all the time thinking about little kingdoms, little kingdom this, little kingdom that, and it's caused us great consternation, great distress. Uh, this, this little kingdom thinking needs to go. And it's important that we watch out because our enemy likes to take little kingdom thinking and spiritualize it. Uh, he'll, he'll try to bait us into wrapping a few little Bible verses around uh, a little kingdom thinking so that we don't ever take our place in action and in, in impact of being a big kingdom member, living a big kingdom life. Watch out. Our emotions are that spiritual alarm system uh, many times letting us know that something's wrong with our thinking. And more often than not, I, I believe it's little kingdom thinking that gets us into a lot of trouble. Watch out. Watch out. And one last uh, thing to consider in a point of response is, is to ask the question, as we see in Daniel and, uh, and his friends, um, does our faith, does our faith produce action? Does our faith produce love? For them, the action was, hey, I'm going to, I'm determined I'm not going to be defiled by this food. So they asked. So they asked again. And so they proposed a test and they went into the test and they, they, their faith found legs. Their faith went into action in their day-to-day -day living as did their love as the test was sensitive to the reality of this man's life being on the line. It's, it's, it's amazingly beautiful picture. Faith, faith must find action in love. Does your faith, is there evidence that you believe in Jesus and the way that you handle your marriage, if you're married today, your, your children, how you conduct yourself in the workplace, uh, how, how you treat your neighbor? Um, are, are these, is, is, are these, relationships and these decisions and the way that you're handling things in life, is it reflective of a big kingdom life or a little kingdom life? Is there enough evidence? I've heard many, many times this expression. Is there enough evidence in your life to convict you of being a Jesus follower? Could somebody convict you in a court of law that, yep, this person loves Jesus? In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, at the end of that verse, Paul writes, and the only thing that counts, the only thing that counts is uh, uh, faith revealing itself, uh, producing its, uh, evidencing itself through love. Faith expressing itself through love. The only thing that counts. Big kingdom life may be lived in Babylon. But it's not of Babylon. And we need to remember that each and every day, and as we enter into this picture of on, you know, kings and kingdoms, that we remember we're big kingdom people if Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And we are intended, we are equipped, we are enabled by God to live a big kingdom life. So I ask you, are you in the big kingdom? Have you, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, entered into the big kingdom of God and experienced that, that uh, new birth that Jesus talked about in John chapter 3? Is that a reality in your life? And the challenge, very clearly, by Daniel's example, is that if that is true, if Jesus has my heart, and I love God, and I'm committed to, to, to following God, and I've accepted that free gift, didn't earn it, didn't deserve it, the free gift of forgiveness, it's time to live and love like I'm a member of the big kingdom. Perhaps you're watching, and, and no, you would say, I haven't yet I made that decision to enter into the big kingdom. My encouragement to you is to consider that. Consider taking Jesus up on his offer. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and you will find rest for your souls. 
I would love the opportunity uh, to talk with you about that decision to make Jesus your Lord, your Savior, that you would move into the big kingdom and to, and to live uh, in that way consistent with all that he has said. It would be a great honor and a great privilege to be a part of that in your life. So this week we're having an incredible privilege of being able to baptize six people. Uh, who've come to put their faith and trust in Jesus and ready to make their public confession of that faith and, and be baptized. What a celebration. If you're in that place where it's, uh, it's that time for you, uh, that you've come to understand and believe in Jesus as well, I would love to talk with you about that. Just text the number on the screen there and we'll get back to you this week. I'm just so thankful for this conversation we've been able to have today. So let's just pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for your blessing. Thank you for meeting us here in this special time. And I pray that your spirit of peace and power would be upon all who are watching in this moment and that all would come to know and love you more and more each and every day of their lives. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a fantastic week. I look forward to seeing you soon.